If there's one thing that defines a serious camera, it is interchangeable lenses. Sensor sizes, body design, mirrorless or mirrored, they're all important. But when you're in a dingy blues club where stage lighting consists of the Marshall's 6 volt power on lamp, or a hide 50 metres from a hungry lion, it's the lens. The availability and breadth of lenses for the Micro Four Thirds system was the factor that motivated me, finally, to abandon my DSLRs. The system has burgeoned since those early days, so that we now have fabulous lenses, like the Panasonic 42.5 f1.2 Noctichron and the Olympus 40-150mm f2.8 Pro. But there is more to a true system than top dollar fabulous. It needs cheap and cheerful, decent quality, frill-free lenses for photographers who don't have money to throw around. Which is where the Mikey 50mm f2 and 35mm f1.7 come in. At £50 or $80 they are cheap. The question is, are they cheap and cheerful or cheap and nasty? Mikey lenses are Chinese built and these feel like something from Pentax circa 1955. That's a compliment by the way. There's a satisfaction to a heavy chunk of metal and glass that glass and plastic, no matter how high quality, will never match. These two Mikeys are essentially the same, both in appearance, build and performance. So I'll talk about the 50mm f2, but we'll be referring to both of them. We have an aperture ring with no click stops, a focusing ring with marked distances, and a depth of field scale. There is no electronic communication with the camera, so you will have to set a Panasonic body to shoot without lens or the shutter won't fire. Olympus bodies don't need any setting change. The focusing is manual, as is the aperture setting. No fancy view at full aperture and auto shutdown and reopen on exposure. That kind of newfangled stuff didn't happen until the late 1950s. If you want to shoot at f5.6, you're going to have to take the camera from your eye, look at the lens and twist the aperture ring. In use, the Mikey's focusing ring is smooth, if not silkily so, and overall it feels like an old film camera lens with a Micro Four Thirds adapter. Manual focusing is easy with it because of its focal length, wide aperture, and the direct mechanical focusing linkage. As you turn it, the lens body moves in and out, no fancy internally moving elements here. There is obviously no in-lens stabilisation, so it doesn't rattle when you shake it. The Panasonic rattle will cost you a minimum extra £250, though they do throw in stabilisation and edge-to-edge -edge sharpness as a bonus. Optical performance. Well, given that this lens sells for about a quarter the price of Olympus's already bargain-priced 45mm f1.8, I wasn't expecting much, and I was right not to. The edges definitely exhibit a negative modulation transfer frequency Nyquist profile. Put technically, they're blurred. The centre isn't. In fact, it is very sharp, not up to its Panasonic and Olympus short tele counterparts, but above the level where I'd feel a lens change was desirable if I were shooting a centrally placed subject. Distortion and purple fringing aren't a problem, though since the fringing mainly occurs on high contrast fine edge detail, I doubt if there's much opportunity for it. Provided the sun is out of shot, flare isn't a problem. Image rendition is very pleasing, as it is with so many older lens designs, mainly because they have so few elements, I think. It is subjective, but there's a cold perfection about modern digital lenses, whereas the oldies are warmer and more plastic. If the Micro Four Thirds native lenses are CDs, the oldies are vinyl. Technically better doesn't always equate to aesthetically better. All in all, performance is best described as interesting. If that sounds derogatory, I don't mean it to. I've really enjoyed using this lens more than most. The lens is made for APS-C DSLRs too, but I wouldn't like it half so much with their optical viewfinders, where stopping the lens down dims the image, making it hard to see and focus. Micro Four Thirds users have the distinct advantage that you can stop it down to f5.6 and the camera boosts the image gain so the finder remains bright. That neatly bypasses the lack of exposure automation on the lens. Set the camera to aperture priority, stop it down where you want and shoot away concentrating solely on image focus. I use this lens at f2 for all my images anyway. My prime use for this lens would be portraiture, where a sharp centre with fuzzy edges is a distinct advantage. But it is surprising how little edge definition matters in many images, and how in many images it just passes for shallow depth of field. 
I'm not saying that compromised performance is superior in any way, just that it can be exploited to pictorial advantage. And to get real, for only twice the price of a cheap DSLR to Micro Four Thirds adapter alone, you have here a rather good portrait lens. It would be superb for talking head videos too. The 35mm version doesn't excite me so much, since it is an oddball focal length for Micro Four Thirds, less suited to portrait photography, and I can't think of anything in particular it would be good for. Mikey's 50mm f2 is a quirky and a highly welcome contribution to the Micro Four Thirds family of lenses. For me, such lenses are as valuable to the system as the Olympus Pro range. If you occasionally feel the need for a portrait lens or shallow depth of field, but can't justify a full-blown native Micro Four Thirds lens for sporadic use, this is the answer. Manual focusing is an easy skill to acquire with a long focus wide aperture lens. And with Micro Four Thirds bodies, provided you are happy to use aperture priority mode, you still have auto exposure. For expert video, manual focus and a non-click aperture ring are actually desirable. And if you lack a lens for talking heads or even a quality video blog, this could well fill the bill. Cheap and cheerful or cheap and nasty, I asked. Certainly cheap, certainly cheerful. It brought a smile to my face, that's for sure. Thanks for watching.